Hello and welcome to my PowerPoint presentation. My name is Brandon Shelley. I am a current MBA student attending Cal State Dominguez Hills. I created this PowerPoint for my CIS 540 class focusing on data warehousing and mining. In this presentation we will be going over some of the highlights of Chapter 3 entitled Retail Sales. This information is from Kimball and Ross's textbook, The Data Warehouse Toolkit, 3rd edition. I hope this PowerPoint presentation will serve as a refresher for any of those that have already read this chapter, as well as assist those that maybe haven't read this material or may be struggling with some of the concepts from it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. To begin with, this chapter starts by going over the four-step dimensional design process. The first step is to select a business process. It's important to select a business process and not a business department or function to avoid duplicating information, as many departments or functions may overlap. Some examples of processes would include how a company purchases materials, takes and processes customer orders, ships items, and even the billing process. The second step is to define the grain. The grain is the most basic information of a process, and we want to identify that for each dimensional table. We want to do this because it's a good practice to start with the basic core information and then work your way up. An example would include one row per scan of an individual product on a sales transaction. The next step is to identify the dimensions that you want to have in your model. A good question to ask is, how do employees describe the data resulting from the business process measurement events? These dimensions that you build will consist of certain grain data that pertain to a specific part of the business process. They answer the who, what, when, where, how, and why associated with that dimension. Some examples would include date, product, customer, employee, facility, and so on. The final step is to identify the facts. You really need to ask what the business process is measuring. Typically these facts are numeric figures that we can sort through. Some examples would be quantity ordered or dollar cost amounts. Be sure to consider both user requirements and the realities of your source data while making decisions to keep this design process on track. Here is an example showing the key inputs to keep in mind for the dimensional design process that we just talked about, which are the business requirements and your data realities. Now that we have covered the basics of the dimensional design process, we will go over a few of the dimensional tables and details that are common with retail sales. The first one we will cover is the date dimension. This dimension is included in most dimension models as we can compare facts and figures over a specific time period. It can be built in advance prior to doing any other work. It can range from historical data that may already be stored to forecasting future dates. Some examples include date, day of week, month, year, quarter, holiday, and weekend or weekday. Attached are two charts which display this information as an example. This dimension is also normally required as most databases may not index SQL date calculations. The next dimensional table we will cover is the product dimension. This dimension describes the product SKU in the store. It is almost always sourced from the operation product master file where a business would keep its product data. In general, a headquarters is normally responsible for defining the appropriate product record and SKU to set each item apart from one another. In this case, merchandise hierarchies are important to group similar attributes of types of products. Despite redundancies in the data, there is no need to normalize the data as the space that would be saved would be very minimal. We will discuss this need for normalization a bit further in the presentation. On this slide, there are a couple examples of the product dimensions and the key inputs that a retail store may want to consider inputting for use for different data inquiries by users. The store dimension describes every store in a retail chain. POS systems may only supply a store number on a transaction 
versus having a comprehensive store master file. So it's a good idea for a business to keep track of this information in a master file to assist with future comparisons. This dimension is also able to have multiple hierarchies such as geographical and organizational. So if a user wanted to look up stores by a state or by district or under a certain manager, they could do that. The chart on this slide provides a good example of some of the information that a retail store may want to include in their store dimension, such as stores by city, state, district, manager, and so on. Finally, the promotion dimension describes the promotion conditions under which a product was sold. Often this is referred to as the casual dimension, as it describes factors thought to cause a change in the product's sales. Attached is an example of a promotion dimension and some of the attributes that a retail store may want to include. The promotional dimension has four casual mechanisms, which are price reductions, ads, displays, and coupons. Depending on the business, they could try tracking and grouping similar promotions into one dimension to help show certain correlations. For example, an ad for a product may also contain a coupon to be used for it as well. On the other hand, separating promotions into different dimensions helps provide the business straightforward information. Items sold that are not part of a promotion should be noted to avoid a null promotion key, which basically means we don't want to leave any areas blank in our data. So if an item is sold without any promotions going on, an identifier should be recorded to note that. The chart on this slide helps show the four different dimensions we just discussed and how they each tie into one retail sales fact table. Each dimension has its own product key and data attributes. Business users are then able to use the fact table to run queries using information from all the dimensions attached to it. Retail stores may also need to consider having a degenerate dimension as well. This dimension is only a dimension key on a fact table and does not have a dimension of its own as the others we have discussed up to this point. These are fairly common when the grain of a fact table represents a single transaction or transaction line. They often play an integral part in fact tables primary key because it represents an identifier of a parent. Some examples include order numbers, invoice numbers, bill of lading numbers, and so on that business users may need to search for. The predictable symmetry of a dimension model allows them to absorb significant changes in data or modeling assumptions such as new dimensions, new dimensional attributes, or new measured facts. The original scheme is able to extend to accommodate changes mainly because the transactional data was initially modeled at its most granular level. As I stated earlier with the promotional dimension, you cannot have a null key in the fact table, so identifiers will need to be created if there is no normal value to input into the degenerate dimension. Surrogate keys are integers that are assigned sequentially as needed to populate a dimension to join dimensional tables to fact tables. If you go back a few slides to look at the four dimensions connecting to the fact table, the lines connecting the two basically represent the surrogate keys. They may take some extra time to implement in the beginning, but they do have many benefits, including buffering a data warehouse from operational changes, integrating multiple sources, improved performance, handling null or unknown conditions, and supporting dimension attribute change tracking. The process of normalizing a dimension table is often referred to as snowflaking. This will help clear out any repetition in the data. The primary reasons against snowflaking include ease of use and performance. The chart on the right shows a snowflake dimension and you can see how much more complicated it gets. Snowflake tables increase the number of connections making it more complex. Minor disk space is saved when snowflaking. Optimizers often have difficulty due to the increased connections. Users' ability to browse within a dimension is also negatively affected as well. So there are many reasons not to normalize or snowflake the dimensions you create. A dimension can contain a reference to another dimension table, and the secondary dimension is referred to as an outrigger dimension. 
These dimensions are acceptable but should be used sparingly. In most cases, the correlations between dimensions should be demoted to a fact table where both dimensions are represented on separate foreign keys. The chart on the right shows an example of an outrigger dimension that has been created off of country demographics. Some designers create separate normalized dimensions for each level of a many to one hierarchy, such as a date dimension, month dimension, quarter dimension, and year dimension, and then include all those foreign keys in a fact table resulting in a centipede fact table. Centipede fact tables also result when designers embed numerous foreign keys into individual low cardinality dimension tables rather than creating a junk dimension. This results in a dimension and fact table relationship as shown on the right. These centipede fact tables should be avoided as normalized dimensions take away from ease of use and performance by overloading the fact table. In summary, this chapter was a first major exposure in the book to designing a dimensional model. Regardless of the industry, it's encouraged to use the four-step process for creating dimensional model designs. By using grain data from the beginning, fact tables can be customized almost any way users would like. It's very important to populate dimension tables with robust descriptive attributes for filtering and labeling. Well, that pretty much does it for my PowerPoint presentation going over Chapter 3, Retail Sales, from Kimball and Ross's Data Warehouse Toolkit 3rd Edition. I hope you found it informative. If you should have any questions or have a need for further information, I suggest checking out the book or going to Kimball's group website. Thank you.